Hello everyone, myself uh, Jacob Prasanna Kumar, I am from the Gate Academy Private Limited. Let me introduce myself. I have done my bachelor's and master's through integrated dual degree program from IIT BHU Varanasi and I uh, have a teaching experience of uh, two years in this the Gate Academy here. I, have, I teach the subjects of strength materials and machine design. In this lecture, I would like to explain to you regarding the basic stress strain curve of ductile materials under tension. So to explain the topic, or to understand the topic, we basically require the correct definitions and correct understanding of the basic definitions of stress, strain, true stress, true strain, etc. And also after the completion of the topic, we should learn uh, some of the topics called as uh, Hooke's Law and all these things here. So in this lecture, basically, I would like to, like to give you a brief explanation regarding the uh, all these definitions and I will give you explain you regarding the stress strain curve of ductile meters under tension. And then I will show you some basic gate questions and IES questions. By just listening this lecture, you would be or you will be in a situation to solve those all the questions there. Okay, the first definition is stress. I know that you people are hearing this term from your first year, we take first year, or even in from 11th class also. But I am sure that I am very much confident that many people are not confident regarding the exact definition of stress. Simply, many people say that stress means force by area. Simply stress means force by area, but in fact, in some conditions may be there where the load is there, that means force is there, area of flux also is there, but in some cases stress will be equal to zero. That's why we must understand the concept of stress in a very thorough way. Let me explain you how. Basically, whenever a force acts on a body, immediately stress won't get induced there. Stress means basically the resistive force induced inside the material per unit area of cross-section. That's the actual definition of stress here. Okay, let me show you by drawing a diagram here. If a body is there, let's assume it's experiencing some load. Let the load be force F here, or load or force is equal to F here. So the area of cross-section of this one is equal to given by A. So the force is acting on this body. Let's take this mass B M here. What happens is, according to the Newton's laws of motion, this will start moving with an acceleration given by F by M here. In this case, there is an externally applied force, but there is no internal resistive force. Internal resistive force is not there. Hence, stress is equal to zero in this situation here. Understand? Let me explain you a little bit more detail, uh, more detail regarding internal resistive force here. For example, instead of putting only single force here, if I apply an opposite reaction force in this way. So what happens is, the body will be at rest, or the body will be in equilibrium basically. So equilibrium means net force in the body is equal to zero. So when the net force in the body is equal to zero, what happens is here, you are trying to expand or elongate the body in x direction, you are trying to elongate this body on this negative x direction also. Okay, so then what happens is the material will try to come or pull or try to regain its original shape and dimensions. We are trying to elongate it from initial length to some other length here, but it is trying to reach its original state here. Okay, so if you release the loads, immediately it comes to this uh, original situation here, provided the load is under some permissible limits, that's called like proportionality limits and all these things, which we're going to study in the coming slides. Okay, so this is two force means here, basically, when the body is trying to expand here, the when the body is getting expanded by the application of the load here, the body will try to come to its original shape and dimensions. So it is trying to put some force in this opposite direction here. Or instead, if you are applying a load in a compressive way, applied load is in a compressive way here. When you are applying the load in a compressive way and you are disturbing from this state and you are making it to come to a little bit lesser length, then this body will try to put a force in this way according to this arrow mark so that it will be coming to this original state and shape here. So this red force, red colored arrow mark depicting the force is called a resistive force produced inside the material here. If you have to understand very thoroughly, I can give you a very simple example. Just take an eraser, rubber eraser and you try to crush it, try to put some compressive force with your fingers. What happens then? You experience some reverse force on your fingers. It is trying to come to the original shape and dimensions there. That original 
shape and dimension the force which is responsible for making it to come to the original shape and dimensions is called as internal resistive force there so to create stress this must be there whenever this force is there then only it will be experiencing stress here stress will be non zero here so if you take the earliest case whichever i have explained you there only this force is there in this case no internal resistive force will be there so in this case stress is equal to zero in this case stress is equal to non zero stress is equal to non zero here okay now in this case as you are applying a tensile force so stress will be greater than zero here understand in this case you are applying a compressive force so stress will be less than zero here so we give the sign of the stress according to the externally applied force here not according to the internal resistive force here because internal resistive force is a dependent force here it's depending upon this value understand so this uh, any other body must be in equilibrium here so if you take any section if this has to be in equilibrium here external applied force should be equal to the internal resistive force here so internal resistive force will be always equal to if it is produced if it is produced means it will be always equal to the externally applied force in terms of magnitude so in this case stress is equal to f by area here so this is greater than 0 because f is tensile in nature and in this case stress is equal to minus f by a because it is creating compression here understand so instead of putting like this so it is tension compression understand so this is the concept of basic stress here so that's why from now don't just remember this formula that stress is equal to force by area that's a very very blunder mistake there so the stress means according to the definition of stress means here the internal resistive force per unit area so the internal resistive force per unit area produced inside the material is called as stress here so if the externally applied force is in tensile in nature it's called as tensile stress if the external applied force is in a compressive way we will take it as a compressive stress here that's the definition of stress here now let's enter into uh, the next type of stress here the next type of stress is the normal stress and it is denoted by sigma here so normal stress means the simple definition is if the externally applied force is acting perpendicular to area of cross section if the external applied force is acting perpendicular to area of cross section it is called as normal stress okay in other way if the externally applied force is acting parallel to area of cross section it is called as shear stress simply if you have to uh, identify what type of stress is there inside the material you just have to see how the load is acting on the area of cross section of the material there so first and foremost thing the primary thing is the body must be in equilibrium so if you see here the first one is not in equilibrium so stress is equal to zero here so second and third cases are in equilibrium so stress will be non zero here so you got the idea that stress is equal to non zero here now to identify which type of stress it is whether it is a normal stress or shear stress then you have to see how the load is acting on the area of cross section of the material here so the load is acting on perpendicular area of cross section we call it as normal stress if it is acting parallel area of cross section it is called as shear stress and regarding tensile and compressive classification which we already know so if it is acting in this way it's uh, we call it this stress as tensile stress if it is acting in this way perpendicular area of cross section we call it as compressive stress here now if you go further we have to understand the concept of strain okay the concept of strain here strain means basically the ratio of change in dimensions to the original dimensions so when you apply load stress will be induced inside the material and that will cause some change of dimensions okay so strain is given by the ratio of these change in dimensions to the original dimensions okay so you see the difference of dimensions produced there and you divide by the original dimensions so that's called as strain here now if you see the classification of strain the first one is linear strain linear strain means 
So change of linear dimensions to original dimensions. Okay. So these dimensions must be linear in nature. That's the only thing here. Understand? Now the next definition is volumetric strain. So here, this is the thing here. So we have these two types of classifications of strains here. Linear strain and volumetric strain here. Understand? So here we have to keep in mind that there is no area strain. Okay, so there is no term called as area strain and it is given or defined as that change of area to the horizontal area. So that's not actually the thing here. Understand? So we will be having only linear strain and volumetric strain here. Now, if you see the slide, the next definition is given by normal strain. Other type of classification is normal strain. And the next one is shear strain. The normal strain is denoted by epsilon and shear strain is denoted by gamma here. So simply the definition for normal strain is if the load is acting perpendicular area of cross section and creating a normal stress or simply I can say that if the strain is created inside the material because of normal stress we call the producer strain is called as normal strain. In the same way if the strain is created or change of dimensions are created because of a shear stress then the strain produced is called as shear strain simply. So, so just you have to identify how the load is acting on the component. If the load is acting perpendicular of cross section, the stress produced is either the normal stress and the strain produced is the normal strain. In the same way, if the load is acting parallel of cross section of the mechanical component here, which is in equilibrium, then the stress produced is called as shear stress and the strain produced is called as shear strain here. Okay. Now the next term comes, which is called as true stress and true strain. The concept of true stress and true strain arises because here we always take in a general way in most of the cases we always take initial dimensions to find out either the stress or strain there. But at every stage whenever the, whenever the load is acting on the component there what happens is the dimensions change. The dimensions will be far different from the original dimensions. But to to quantify numerically the values of stress and strain we are taking original dimensions. Let me show you by taking an example here. If you are having a tensile member and we are applying a tensile load like this, let's take the load BP here. So let's take initial area of cross section be A0 and the length B L0 here. So after the elongation, because of the applica applied load here, P, area of cross section has changed to A1 and length got changed to L1 here. Understand? As here the load is acting in a tensile way, so length will increase and area will decrease here. That's the basic thing here. Understand? Now if I ask you the question, what is the stress here? First primarily you say that it's a normal stress because the load is acting parallel, perpendicular to area of cross section here. Okay. Now if I ask you the magnitude of stress, then you'll get a confusion. Whether to give the stress as P by A1 or P by A0. Understand? Thus this confusion arises here. Okay, both answers are correct here. But if you are taking original dimensions, that is A naught and L naught here. If you take original dimensions, or in a better way, you can write down this one as initial dimensions. Initial dimensions give you conventional stress. and strain. Okay, or this thing is also called as engineering stress. Engineering stress and strain here. If you take <coughs> instantaneous dimensions, if you take instantaneous dimensions here, you are Stresses and strains are called as true stress and true strain. So here comes the definition of true stress and true strain. So the most cases, the most cases, whatever stress we take, whatever strain we find out by taking the initial dimensions, that stress or strain is basically called as conventional stresses and conventional strains. But whatever we are actually finding out or whatever the values we are getting out by taking instantaneous dimensions, they are called as true stress, true stress and true strain here. So simply if you want to have 
the conventional stress value, this will be P by A naught. Conventional strain is equal to given by change of length. So L1 minus L0 by L1 minus L0 by L0 here. Understand? So like that, you can, if you want, you can write down here itself. Conventional stress. <coughs> So conventional strain. So if you want to have true stress, true stress value is equal to given by P by A1 and true strain. True strain value you want here. Uh, the air force is changing from A0 to A1 and length is changing from L0 to L1 here. So true strain is equal to given by DL by L integral from L0 to L1 here. So this is how you're going to find out the true strain here. So this is the thing here. Okay. So this is the definition of true stress and true strain here. Later we understand when we're going to use the conventional values of stresses and strains or when we're going to use the true values of stresses and strains here. Okay. Now let's enter into the main part of this uh, lecture. The stress strain curve of ductile materials under tension. You can draw the whole diagram which was depicted on the slide there. Every point and everything is clearly shown there. You can draw, draw the diagram here. Here I will be drawing the rough diagram simultaneously explaining you the concept here. So if you take a material, a tensile material, generally we prefer to take cylindrical shaped members there. So that it will be easier to identify the extensions or contractions or the change of dimensions or the behavior of the material here. So you take a, a cylindrical member, cylindrical shaped member and do tensile testing. So what you're going to do is, you're going to use universal testing machine, UTM, universal testing machine here. So it is hydraulically operated and uh, uh, we put the loading and we increase the load very, very slowly. So basically how you're going to do is, we put the load and we apply or increase the load very, very slowly. Very, very slowly means very, very slowly. Because here, we must give sufficient time for this material to experience resistive force, internal resistive force. Just like uh, in thermodynamics, we study regarding quasi static equilibrium. That means the system will be changing from one state to other state, but in between it also it will be in equilibrium with the surroundings. In the same way, in a correlated way here, we are increasing the load very, very slowly that at every instant, at every instant, whatever the internal resistive force is produced, that is equal to the externally applied force here. So the body is in equilibrium. Because I said that equilibrium is necessary to create internal resistive force, hence stress will be induced there. So if you don't create equilibrium, so internal resistive force will not be produced and hence you can't experience stress inside the material there. Sometimes if you don't create equilibrium, that will become a little bit complex way of loading case there. So which we can't analyze in very uh, easier way. So we need to keep the body in equilibrium here. So that's why we are not employed, that means the common people are not employed to do the job. We hire a technician to do the loading case there. So who are very much experts that like how the material will behave, how slowly they have to increase the load. So they'll be doing that. Understand? So if you do the tensile loading here in this way and you increase the load very, 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 very slowly, then you're going to get a curve in this way. Basically, you will be having two instruments on the whole apparatus of the universal testing machine there. One is extensometer and second one is the dial gauge. So the dial gauge basically measures the value of load, the magnitude of load there. Okay. And the extensometer will be measuring the extension of the component. So basically, so extension and the load are the two things measured in the uh, on the universal testing machine during the tensile testing experiment here. So when you do it, so you have load and uh, uh, elongation here. So if you want stress, basically we are finding out conventional stress only here. So if you want stress, you divide the load by original area of cross section. So before loading itself, you take the component, measure the area of cross section, measure the length also. So you divide the area by the load, you'll be getting the stress value. If you divide the elongation by the value of original length, then you'll be getting the strain value there. Okay, so if you plot the curve between this conventional stress value and conventional strain value, you will be getting a curve in this way here. So conventional strain is denoted by epsilon here because it's a normal strain basically. So if you apply the load and you increase the value of load very slowly, you will experience a curve in this way here. So up to some point, the curve will be a straight line like this. 
the curve will be a straight line here. That means like stress and strain are both are proportional to each other. Just like if you observe this uh, slide here, you'll be observing the point as A. So this point is denoted by A here and it is called as proportionality limit. So that means up to this point, stress and strain are proportional to each other. If you double the stress, strain also will double there. Only up to this point here. So this is going to observe here. And other thing which you can observe here is, if you release the load at any point, at any point, in say between this point O and A, from here to here, at any point if you release the load, immediately it will take the same path and reach the ozone dimensions here. So it will take the same path and reach the ozone dimensions here. This is how you will be experiencing the behavior of the material under tension up to this point here. Okay, so two properties are there here. One thing is elasticity, the metal is elastic in nature and next one is linear in nature here. You take any material, it will be experiencing this type of phenomena here. Now, after point A, if you still increase the value of load, then what happens is basically here, the curve may not be linear, but it's little bit curved here, but still elastic in nature. So the elasticity, the property, the behavior, elasticity will be lasting up to this point B. So this point B is called as elastic limit. E dot L here. So the material is experiencing or having this property of this elasticity till the point B here. So this region is called as elastic region. But it's having the property of linearity only up to point A. So this point A, the region up to point A is called as linear region. So this point is called as linear region here. So elastic region and this is the linear region here. Okay, now if you still increase the value of load very slowly, then what happens is a point comes, we draw to the point by C here, from there, the material loses its elasticity. That means if you release the load, it will be having some permanent change in dimensions. It will not reach the original shape and dimensions there. That means original state of dimensions and uh, uh, shape and all these things here. So this point from where plastic deformation starts, the elasticity means basically the ability of the material to reach its original shape and dimensions. Plasticity means inability of the material to reach its original shape and dimensions. Understood? So that's a point here. Okay. So plasticity. So plasticity basically in other way it's called as yielding also. So this point C is called as yield point. So it starts from point C here. So from point C what you're going to observe is the curve will come as a horizontal straight line for ideal ductile material which is under tension. That means in this region you don't need to increase the value of stress to create some strain here or to produce or to increase some strain here. So to increase some strain, you are increasing some strain here, okay, you are creating some strain here. But in this region there is no requirement for you to increase the value of stress. You just have to keep the value of initial value of stress itself. Understand? So from this point C, if anywhere if you release the load, if anywhere you please release the load here, what happens is, if we are releasing from this point here, it will take a path like this, a straight line, which will be having the same slope as this line here. And this will be having this amount of permanent strain here. So this is the permanent strain here. So the metal will not reach its social shape and dimensions. So that's why we call the metal got yield. Yield means it's undergone some permanent change in dimensions or plastically deformed here. Okay, so this will be continuing up to some point here, but one point reaches, we denote it by D here, from where you have to increase the value of stress or to create some, increase the value of the strain value here. So in from this region what happens is, to increase or to create some value of strain, we have to increase some value of stress here. So the curve will go in this way here. So the curve will be having a non-zero slope. So that means to create some strain or to increase some strain here, you have to increase the value of stress. Increasing the value of stress means you have to in induce more stress. You have to induce more stress means you have to apply more load. That's a requirement here. So this region up to point B is called as elastic region here. And from the region from C to D where this yielding is occurring is called as yielding region or plastic region. Plastic or yielding region. 
a plastic or yielding region here. So in this region here, there you have to increase the value of stress to create some strain here. That means, let's assume that like here in this region, you have created some strain delta epsilon here. In this region also you have created some strain delta epsilon here. Both are of same magnitude. The change of strain is of same magnitude here. But in this region, you are not required. You are not required to increase the value of stress. But in this region, you are required to increase the value of stress. That's the difference here. So the material, in other way, got little bit hardened due to the production of strain here. So the region which is starting from D is called as strain hardening region. Okay, so this region from here is called as strain hardening region. So this curve goes in this way, which is a peak point here. So this peak point basically is the highest value of stress the metal can take. So this point is called as ultimate stress. So ultimate stress means maximum stress ultimate stress means the maximum stress the metal can take. So what happens is after the point E, you take it as E here, the curve drops down and it will fractures. So in this region from E to F, the material which was initially like this, that means initially like this, this material will become, which is initially like this, the material will become like this. So its area of cross-section decreases drastically to a very high extent. So in this region, or we call this region as necking region, And this point F is called as fracture point. So because the fracture occurs, the metal will break into two pieces. So here we get the doubt. First doubt is, we have discussed regarding the names of the regions from O to A as linear region, O to B as elastic region, C to D as plastic region, D to E strain hardening region, E to F necking region. Now what about B to C. Here there is a word here. We are not having any name here. So practically what happens is, in practical situations, if you take some material and if you try to draw the stress strain curve, all these three points A, B, C, they will try to come at a single point. That means the variation or the difference between these three points will be very, very less. Very, 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 very less. So, instead of uh, having three points in the real materials, you will be having only single point. So, only single point will be there. So, practically speaking, so there is no meaning uh, the, between the region between point B and point C here. That's the one point here. Second point comes that why the metal is breaking at a lesser value of stress. Generally, if you think by having some common sense, so the metal must fail or the metal must undergo fracture just to buy uh, experiencing higher value of stress. So it must undergo fracture here itself. Or if it is undergoing fracture here, the stress must be higher, somewhere else, more. But this is not occurring here. The reason is, very very important is, the reason is here, we are drawing the curve between conventional stress and conventional strain. Conventional stress and conventional strain means we are taking original dimensions. We always take original dimensions to find the magnitude of stress and strain here. The conventional values are not the actual values or actual values of stress and strain the metal is experiencing. So true stress and true strain actually gives you the true values of stress and strain the metals are experiencing there. So if you draw the curve again using true values of stress and strain, you will be getting a curve almost coinciding up to point D. That means this curve will be coinciding up to point D here. A true stress and curve will be coinciding with this one up to point D here. But this will be having a different values from D to F here. So there is a huge lot of difference. Understand? So why we are getting higher value and why we are getting lower value here? Because in the necking region, to find out the point F or finding out the stresses in this region for this conventional stress and conventional strain graph, we are taking original area of cross section. We are not taking this instantaneous area of cross section here. And because stress is equal to given by uh, force by area, 
Okay, it is actually less here, but you are taking higher value of area, which is initial area of function here. So you are increasing the value of area there, so the stress decreases here. That's why mathematically you are getting a lesser value here. So if you uh, compare between the area of function in this region and this region here, so this region stress it will be very high because area of function has decreased to a very very higher extent here. It has decreased to a very higher extent here. That's why we will be getting this one here. Okay, but in the subject of strength of materials, basically we deal with stresses and strains only up to proportional to limits. And in manufacturing subject or the machine design subject, we will be dealing with the stresses up to the point D here. So in these two subjects, basically we are going to deal with uh, conventional stresses and conventional strains because there is a very very less amount of difference between these conventional values and true values of stress and also strain. So unless and until it is written as true stress or true strain, then only we have to take the stresses as true stresses and true strains there. Otherwise, if it is written simply as stress or strain, that means they are conventional values itself. Now, let me explain you the principle called as Hooke's law. Okay, so Hooke's law means basically, let me give you a history of Hooke's law here. is given by the scientist Robert Hooke. He has observed a thing that when a spring is experiencing a tensile force or compressive force P, he has observed that load is proportional to elongation. He has observed that load is proportional to elongation. This is the thing which he has observed here and the load is equal to K into elongation where K is called a spring constant. This is the phenomena which he has observed here. The same phenomena or the same behavior he has observed in solid materials also. He has observed that when the stresses and strains are within proportionality limit, load and elongation are proportional to each other. When load is proportional to elongation, we will get that load can be written as stress into area and elongation can be written as elongation by L. Because proportionality is there, so constants can be written here. So if you remove all the constants here, basically we will get stress proportional to strain like this. So A is a constant, we just remove this thing here, stress proportional to strain here. So Hooke's law is can be given by load proportional to elongation or stress proportional to strain here. So this behavior is there, stress is proportional to strain, behavior is there only up to proportional to limit. So Hooke's law will be valid only up to proportional to limit. In many textbooks, in many situations, many people are getting confused that like whether the Hooke's law is valid up to a fracture point or only proportional to limits. Here I am telling you the correct thing here. Hooke's law is valid only up to proportional to limits. Okay, so Hooke's law is valid only up to the proportional to limit itself. Okay, because we expect it to be linearly proportional. Understand? Some people even say uh, Hooke's law is equal to given by stress proportional to epsilon power n. So the whole curve can be written as sigma proportional to epsilon power n. So Hooke's law is valid up to fracture point. That's actually wrong. Keep this in mind here. Stress so proportional to strain. Okay, it's a linear equation here. It's a one degree equation here. Understand? N is equal to one. The next concept is failure. You must know what is the definition of failure. If you're having a machine element or a component, let me take an example as a bolt. If you have a bolt here, Okay, so after tightening the bolt, the bolt is breaking into two pieces. Okay, okay, first first case is breaking into two pieces. Second case is the bolt may become like this. Its dimensions got changed here. That means the bolt is still intact, but it has experienced some plastic deformation here. So when it is like this, we can't use it, right? So we'll be using the bolt only when it is of this shape and dimensions here. Understand? So failure means if any machine element is not able to perform its function as expected. So we call that the machine element got failed. So now if you see brittle materials, so brittle materials basically they will undergo failure by breaking. Okay, so in this lecture we are not going to study regarding stress-strain curve of brittle materials, but basically they will break into pieces. But in ductile materials, 
we we don't need to wait till the metal break into two pieces because if simply if the stress is reaching the yield point and the metal is experiencing plastic deformation permanent deformation in this way then only we can't use it at the stage itself we can't use it so yield point is a very very important value in ductile materials there so yield point decides whether if the stress is at that region or the vicinity of the yield point or the means at that value or if it is more than the yield point immediately we decide that not to use that machine element there so we'll be using that machine element only when stresses induced inside the material throughout the volume are far less than or equal to or just below the yield point values there. So that's the thing here. So if they are above that value, we'll not be using that. So that's why it's very, very important here. So importance of yield point is, so in the yield point actually decides the strength of the material. So strength means basically the stress the metal can take up to failure. So the failure of ductile materials is occurring at yield points. So simply we take the strength of a ductile material according to the yield point stress value. Okay, that's the importance of yield point here. Now let's go into the next definition here. Stress strain curve next concept here, stress strain curve for mild steel. Okay, so in stress strain curve for mild steel here in this lecture, uh, I'm going to tell you how it is different with the earlier or the ideal stress strain curve for ductile materials there. So whatever diagram I explained you earlier, it is corresponding to ideal ductile material. So we expect that to happen. Okay. But every metal can behave in a different, different way. So the stress strain curve for mild steel will be looking according to the slide diagram there. So where we see the first thing is it is having multiple lead points. Okay, so it's having multiple lead points and the second one is here in the plastic region, in the plastic region, the material will not be having a constant slope line. So it will be having a non-zero slope line there. Okay, so in this mild steel here, basically we know basically the yield points here. So yield point is the upper, point, upper yield point and the lower yield point here. Let me show you in this diagram here. So these are the upper yield point, upper yield point, uh, upper yield limit and lower yield limit here. So upper yield limit and the lower yield limit here. So this is the points here. Understand? So I said that yield point is very much required in designing a machine element using ductile materials. So if you take a mild steel, simply you can identify the yield point here. So yield point is this much value, the corresponding to the stress value here. So we make sure the stress inside the material should not go beyond this value here. Okay, so if you take some other material like aluminium, if you take some other material like aluminium here, if you see in the slide uh, itself, you see the stress strain curve for aluminium is in this way. It's not having a sharp yield point. We can't identify the yield point here. So, strain here. Okay, so in this case, in these cases, what has been done is a line is drawn having a slope of Ings modulus from 0.2% strain. So strain is equal to given by 0 0.2 by 100. So from this value, a line is drawn having a slope of Ings modulus to intersect this stress strain curve. So the point where it is intersecting, this point is taken as proof stress. Proof stress means the points, this point gives you a guarantee that in this material here, yielding will not occur below this point. Yielding will occur above this point itself. So if you make sure your stress values to be less than this point, your stress value is less than this point, then automatically your metal will be safe. Your metal will not fail or your machine element will not fail at all. So such type of behavior is there not only in aluminium, it is there in copper also. So these type of materials are taken into consideration. The stress strain curves are drawn and empirically this result is decided. So if you draw a line to any of these materials having a slope of Ings modulus to intersect the stress strain curve, so the point whatever it comes, you take that as a proof stress value there. So this is how designing for these subductile metals is done. Okay, now here I would like to explain you 
why we are having multiple yield points in mild steel here? Because that's a peculiar thing. The reason for multiple yield points in mild steel here. Okay. In mild steel, basically, we are having two elements, two periodic table elements. One is carbon, other one is iron. Okay, so they are arranged in a lattice formation. So in the matrix of iron, just like this one. Iron here, carbon atom is inserted here. So the carbon atom will be somewhere else. Okay, so here basically the carbon atom will be larger than the interstitial volume here. So it, these are all iron atoms here. The blue elements are all our iron atoms here. So the carbon atom is actually larger than the interstitial volume here. But due to the process of diffusion, it is forcefully inserted into this region here. When it is forcefully inserted into this region, what happens is it will create some damage on this arrangement of these iron atoms and the carbon atoms here. So when it is forcefully inserted, then it will, the matrix will be changing in this way here. So when it has forcefully inserted into the interstitial volume between the iron atoms, it is creating some normal contact force. So there is some normal contact force between the material of carbon and material of iron here. So as there is some normal contact force here, that force gives rise to some stress. That's why when you try to apply some load to create some uh, yielding, then what happens is basically the material will experience higher yield point. But you know after the yielding gets starts, the material will experience some plastic deformation. So it's plastic deformation means like there will be some change of dimensions. When it, there is some change of dimensions, what happens is the interstitial volume will increase and that will be sufficient to accommodate this carbon atom. So when it is sufficient to accommodate the carbon atom, no normal contact forces will be there in, at that stage. So when there are no normal contact forces, no stress will be there. So basically, whatever the stress is there because of other deformations, only that value of stress will be there. So the stress from the yield point or the upper yield point will suddenly drops to lower yield point there. So this question was asked in even ISRO interview there. So kindly keep this in mind. So this is a schematic way of explaining, a simplest way of giving explanation regarding the multiple yield points of mild steel here. Now let's see some questions. A 100 mm into 5 mm into 5 mm bar free to expand is heated from 15 degrees centigrade to 40 degrees centigrade. What shall be the stress developed? So if you draw the diagram, the bar is like this. So it is 5, it is 5 and this bar is having a length of 100 mm here. So if you heat it from 15 degrees centigrade to 40 degrees centigrade, what will happen is basically here it will try to elongate. It will elongate freely because we are giving some energy. So because of thermal energy there, it will elongate according to the, the value of its coefficient of thermal expansion, it will experience elongation there. Okay, so it will experience elongation here. When it is experiencing elongation, just like this one here, So these blue lines are the final dimensions here. So it is experiencing free expansion here. So when it is expanding freely like this, because the applied temperature, cha applied change of temperature here, there are no internal resistive forces produced inside the material. So in this case, no internal resistive forces are produced here. So that gives us the stress is equal to zero inside the material. So the answer is equal to given by no stress. That's why in practical situations here, you take a railway tracks. So the rails are having some space between them. We can't make it the rail of some one kilometer. So we have to take some 10 meters, 10 meters like this and we have to join them. So in between them, we we'll, we'll leave some gaps. So if they, are, if they are expanding and contracting freely, then what happens is their stress will be zero inside the material there. So we try to keep as less amount of stress 
inside the middle of the rails there. So when the stress is less inside the middle of the rails, so the chance of failure will be very, very less. So if you restrict them to expand or contract, so stress will increase because the, because the normal reaction force between the rails, the stress will increase to higher value. So if the stress is reaching the failure stress, then automatically the rail will crack or undergo failure. And uh, if any train comes over the rails, it will not be able to sustain the load of that train there. That's the concept here. So simply with the basic definition of stress itself, we can tell the answer. So many people are not clear regarding those things here. Kindly have a look here itself. Okay. Now, if you go into the next question, it's a gate question here. It's from gate 2013, mechanical engineering paper here. It's given that a rod of length L having uniform area of cross-section A. A rod of length L having uniform area of cross-section A. is subjected to a tensile force P as shown in the figure below. If the Young's modulus of the material varies linearly from E1 to E2, Young's modulus varies from E1, which is E1 here, it is E2, from one end to the other end here, the normal stress developed at the section S, S, E is. So there is a section taken here, yes, and this is yes here. So this length is L by 2 here, L by 2. Many people miss this question. Many people missed this question simply because they didn't knew the exact definition of stress. So simply I have given you the definition that the definition of stress is internal resistive force produced inside the metal per unit area. So first and foremost thing is to create an internal resistive force, the body must be in equilibrium. So if you see this example, the body is in equilibrium. So the body is in equilibrium, so internal resistive force is there. And that is equal to P itself. So stress is equal to simply given by internal resistive force of the material P per unit area of correction here. Simply P by itself. So there is nothing to get confused here. They have given you a confusion or uh, some extra thing that its Young's modulus value is changing from E1 to E2 here around the length here. Although practically it's not possible uh, because Young's modulus is actually a property of the material here. So in this case, Young's modulus value is not at all relating to the value of stress. It's not disturbing the value of stress there. So simply stress means externally applied force per unit area provided the body is in equilibrium here. So this is how you're going to get the value here. So based upon this one, the correct option is A itself. So I hope this video has given you a very much clear idea regarding many of the concepts which you are already knowing but having a half knowledge or not clear understanding there. So I hope those all the concepts and uh, explanations, everything is clear now. And second one, which I'm hoping is you got to know how we teach in the Gate Academy. What is the level of lecture? What is the quality of the lecture we give in the Gate Academy here? So you got to know how actually the lecture happens here. So this is how we teach. This is the level at which we give. This is the quality we, we provide you here. So using this thing, many people have already made a fruitful career in various IITs, PSUs, BARC, etc. there. So you too can join us and have a bright future here. Thank you so much. All the best.